with this in mind, let's jump straight in. Let's begin. So the first order of the day, ladies and gentlemen, is a bit of an overview on the market. Uh, as Bitcoin is currently sitting at 62.7K, Ethereum 3.1K, and Solana 135. Uh, as a reminder for the audience, just over a week ago, BTC went through its fourth halving. So it's an incredible milestone in BTC life where the block rewards were divided by two for the miners. And uh, at the time, the asset's price had experienced tons of volatility, especially with the global uh, geo geopolitical situation. So BTC went under 60 60K actually last week, and then it went above 65K last weekend. And since then, it's been fluctuating between 62 and 64K. Uh, the crypto fear and greed index is still pretty high at 67. So I want to hear it from the other people from the panel. Um, actually, I'm very curious to hear your take on this. What's happening on the, like, what's your perspective on the recent volatility on the market? Uh, let's begin by Strikecore Alpha. Want to hear your take on this? Bottom left corner, my friend, you're muted. You are speaking about me, Pavel? Yeah, would would love to have your take on this, like the volatility of the market. What's going on here? Yeah, so so uh, for in my, my opinion, is like uh, uh, right now the volatility is something the retracement what we see uh, those days is something natural. Like the market was going up like crazy for the last like uh, couple of weeks, not, not even weeks, months. Uh, so with such a growth, with such a amount of capital that flowed into the market. Uh, it's natural that you need to have some kind of cool down of the market because market was, you know, heating uh, all the time for the last couple of months. So, so it's, it's natural. We've seen this in the past. So that's, that's one thing. And also part of that was also the hype around the, uh, around the uh, Bitcoin ETFs. They were loading bags for a very long period of time, like since uh, January. So they loaded a lot of money into, into, uh, into Bitcoin and into the market which was uh, accelerating everything. And once they loaded, uh, like, let's say, maybe not enough, but a lot of capital, so uh, most of the uh, initial needs has been filled in, uh, we seen uh, the lower uh, interest uh, from, that, from, that, from that angle. And the thing is that most of the capital that we seen uh, just recently in the last couple of months was institutional. It was not uh, growth driven by the, retail capital it was dr a growth driven by the institutional capital so which means um, we still have a lot of room for for uh, uh, for retail customers to join the race right now so that's one thing then second thing in my opinion uh, that that is driving this uh, um, volatility that we see right now besides uh, institutional capital is global economy because uh, with uh, running the uh, launching the the, the uh, ETFs of, on Bitcoin, uh, we have tightened a little bit uh, crypto market with the traditional markets because uh, uh, institutions and people from the institutional side were loading their bags of Bitcoin with using or with using uh, using those uh, those Bitcoin ETFs. So once they loaded the bags and the economy was uh, going down a little bit, there was like a lot of turbulence on the. Uh, Fed side with with cutting the interest rates, with increasing the interest rate, with the inflation, with different things. The UK is in the recession. Uh, the Germany is in the recession. So we have a lot of problems in the global economy. So once they started seeing that, some of the people um, started to to also uh, react uh, in the same way as they always do. They accumulate cash. So once uh, those big boys started accumulating cash, like Warren Buffett like um, all the you know big investors uh, most probably some of the investors that had bags filled in with bitcoin etf started to sell their asset as well and including that uh, bitcoin etf uh, bitcoin etf so once the bitcoin etfs were liquidated the bitcoins went to the market once they went to the market the market was uh, turning into the downtrend so those in my opinion are the two factors that that are driving the the market that we see right now and also the last third thing you know, usually we have the saying, sell in May and go away. So we are very close to that. 
um, this uh, seasonality this, uh, of, of the market. And I believe this is like the third thing that, that is driving this, this, uh, this part of the cycle. Yeah, that's, that's actually very interesting. And to add some perspective on what you just said, according to CoinShares, the digital investment product saw an outflow for the third consecutive week. So Bitcoin in particular with 423 million outflow and Ethereum with 38 million outflow. So this is going to be, you, know, you see, quite important to monitor these trends on the institutional sites for sure. Uh, I want to hear from the rest of the panel. What's your perspective on the recent movement on the market? I want to hear it from you guys. Diego, do you have, do you have any take on this? Sorry, but bottom left corner, Katie, what's your take on the recent volatility on the market? Um, it's definitely interesting times, but honestly, I think it's pretty standard. You know, I think a lot of people freak out a little bit too much in like the current market state that we're in. Um, like, and look at out other communities and like, regardless of what community you're in, I think a lot of people always expect it to be different this time. It's not going to be the same, but it generally ends up being relatively the same. And I mean, it's exciting. You have your ETF money flowing through and a whole bunch of really awesome things for us all to look forward to. So, I mean, market-wise, we're just in a boring state short term, but it ramps up pretty soon. So, <laughs> I can relate on the terms, on the word boring. This has been certainly, after such an intense couple of months, we're in a, we're in a bit of a of an in-between situation, I can completely relate on this. Uh, so next order of business, I actually want to talk about a very specific topic, which is Lazarus Group. So Laz Lazarus Group, as you know, is the North Korean hacker group. Um, for those who are not familiar, they are very prolific in cyber criminality with over 2 billion of stolen assets on the last couple of years. And a recent report from Slowmist said that Lazarus pretended to be a Fenbushi capital partner on LinkedIn and conduct phishing operations in the name of investments and meetings. And then Lazarus groups, you know, they have co contacted targets in the crypto industry through LinkedIn, Twitter, use malware to steal employees' privilege or assets. This has been, this has been messy. Uh, and I have, I actually have a little anecdote on this that I want to share with you for the listeners. When we announced our fundraising, uh, we were actually contacted by one of my investors sent me an email saying, hey, Bubble Maps, you should check this Google Sheets. It's a treasury management uh, spreadsheet. You should definitely check it out. And when I received this message, I felt something was wrong in the tone of the, because my investor, he's my good friend, we talk regularly. And in his tone, I felt something wrong was going on. And I sent him a DM on Telegram saying, hey, Garlam, you're sure this is, this is you here, this email? And actually, it was not him. His account, his email was hacked, and it was a phishing attempt from Lazarus Group. So they're very active. They're targeting everybody in crypto, all the companies that just raised, all the popular protocols, etc., um, so I actually, actually want to hear it from you guys. Like, uh, were you ever targeted by such organization? Uh, is there any anecdote you're willing to share? Well, uh, I have a couple, <laughs> if you want. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, I can jump. Yeah. In. Um, uh, so, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the last, the last attempt on, uh, uh trying to, uh, get funds from from our organization, so from Nomad Fulcrum, which is a hedge fund uh, operating in the crypto space, uh, was like yesterday, <laughs> actually. So that's the fun fact. Uh, so uh, and it was super similar to, to, to what you are saying. So uh, one of our investors said, like, Pavel, you need to check this product. This is super interesting. Uh, they are doing something similar to you. Someone did a very good research. They read the whole white paper of ours, which is like 40 pages long without images, actually, you know. So, so this is like a, a book to read uh, and to understand how we do, what we do, how system works, how, how, you know, smart contracts work, how we are combining TradFi with DeFi, where the money flows are, etc. So they understood everything. And they were reading this email. Uh, from the account of uh, one of our investors. Um, uh, and they were texting also us through the, his uh, Telegram in the same time. 
that, uh, hey mate, I'll send you the email, you ch should check it out. They are super interesting company, they're young in the business, you might have a, like a, a lot of interesting uh, deals with them uh, while integrating your products with theirs. Uh, check it out, connect the wallet, I will send you the, the testnet solution. Um, it's deployed on uh, the main Ethereum chain right now, but it's a testnet, of course. And, and um, what I did, uh, I called the guy. And he said that he never sent me any email and like, like he invested uh, some time ago. So, so uh, they wanted actually to reach us out somewhere soon to have a conversation about the update, something like that, this and that. Uh, but they never sent, did anything right o o on this. So that's one thing. But another thing uh, that happened like also in the last two days uh, was uh, a little bit more interesting. Uh, someone most probably this is the same hack that, they, that happened in there. Were from from uh, from uh, uh, one of our investors that they have been hacked, and uh, we found out and we we send a, a case for the prosecutor here in in, in Europe um, because someone started to sign soft as me and as our company with other people, and most probably what happened they hacked an account of that guy uh, that was one of our investors. They steal the soft. They uh, used the signed soft from DocuSign wow. to send this once again for another DocuSign. DocuSign, they recreated the whole soft, everything, including my signature, and they started sending this to some kind of uh, alpha groups, to some, some 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 different people, and they raised over one hundred twenty thousand. Uh, this is what I found out since yesterday. Uh, they raised um, a signing agreement as me sending as me uh, because you can create an account on the DocuSign on my name, like and on your name even on anyone's name and no one is able to check that but the email is, is different right so so this is what they did and we found out a few people and we sent you know all the documents and and all the data to, to the prosecution most probably no one will get their money back because of of who did it well, I, I don't know who but it was a professional work so so uh, in the last couple of days we had a couple of this kind of attempts and you know the third thing is like most probably you will find in the internet like 100 different people named Pavel Waskarzewski like I do that are going to sell you all the trading bots or the money making solutions and everything, you know. So, um, so phishing is another like big problem in the space that is happening all the wow. time. Wow, so those three things like just a couple. The of second <laughs> story is actually scary because it is, as you said, yeah. it is very scary to receive. You receive a soft and you you believe you're investing into someone else's project. But in reality, this is a scam attempt, and it's pretty hard to find because it's not yeah. on-chain data. This is completely off-chain. Yeah. So you receive it. Exactly. How you want to validate that? Absolutely. No, this, this is a very tricky one. Uh, Damir, I think you wanted to share an anecdote as well, maybe on Lazarus Group? Uh, not exactly on Lazarus. I mean, maybe actually. Uh, our current CMO is act was actually before at uh, Harmony, and they, and they got hacked, I think, by Lazarus. Uh, but oh, one of the biggest hacks sure. from Lazarus, one of the biggest yeah. ones, actually. And uh, so, yeah, that's one experience we have. And the other one is that every time, every single time we launch any kind of sale on Massa, every single time in a few minutes, people have replicated the website perfectly. It's the domain name is ready. Everything is ready. And they try to send people to this fake website that resembles perfectly the exact one. Last time, they actually replicated a working version of our Explorer with a fake banner on top. Gives you an idea of the advance of the thing in a few minutes. This is insane. No, th this is very advanced for sure. KTP, as a public figure, you have your own YouTube channel, Telegram. I I'm sure you must be susceptible to a lot of impersonators. Do you have any stories you want to share with us? Yeah, I have a lot of impersonators. But honestly, for the people listening, instead of just impersonators with influencers, it would be the phishing scams and the bad links. Because if you, like, if anybody launches a single thing, it's literally replicated within minutes you have your scam tokens your scam websites your scam links and your scam telegrams that take you to scam links there's a lot of people uh, around our community in particular that keeps getting scammed and it's a community that's really well known and versed in crypto so you know this it's everywhere um and i think like last cycle the biggest hack for instance was like access for a lot and a lot of money and i don't think like the amount of money that was stolen last cycle is going to be in comparison to this cycle, the amount that users are going to lose. So like if you're in crypto, you should be upping your security and learning about safety and connecting your wallet to things and learning how to actually read what you're signing. So yeah, my message would be more to people. <laughs> no, but I completely agree with you. And the thing is, and I keep telling this to people, 
it's not crypto who's susceptible to hacks necessarily. It's the whole internet, the whole just computer. Because 10 years ago, if your computer was compromised, what, what would, like 20 years ago, what would they do with it? They would steal a credit card. They would buy stuff on Amazon for 10K. It's super, like, it was not worth it to be a criminal for such low amounts. But nowadays in crypto, if you manage to find a susceptibility, a susceptibility anywhere in crypto, suddenly you can, you can win dozens of millions. So that's an entire game. And people who used to be white hats before, now they're very tempted to be black hat because the amounts are so much different. They're so much higher. And uh, when I say the whole internet is, could be compromised is I've recently seen someone getting hacked by one of the, let's say, most particular thing ever. He simply downloaded a Chrome extension that were, that were like very, that was actually very popular, but the Chrome extension was hacked for a bit and he downloaded the malware and his security keys were compromised. And another example of this is someone who downloaded a subtitle file. Everybody downloads subtitle files. They are so small and we don't really, we don't really, you know, doubt them for a second, but actually they can be super, super dangerous for the computer as well. Uh, Katie, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you just touched on um, downloadable files and that was literally what I was about to say because everybody lately around us that have been getting scammed is due to download things as well. So like literally anything on your computer that you can download, a hacker these days can put bad malware inside of it. So like if you're doing crypto on your computer or even having your credit cards and your bank account linked to things, like you should look at having separate computers, especially if you're downloading a bunch of stuff where you're not necessarily paying attention to what you're doing. It's not just clicking on bad links and connecting or bad websites from any like brand new protocol that's popping up. Just simply downloading anything on your computer can have malware in it these days. So yeah, I think they're getting a lot more sophisticated and it's a little bit crazy. A AD, before we jump to the next topic, any advice you want to give to our listeners on maybe some best practices to avoid getting hacked and to avoid losing <coughs> everything in a click? Yeah, sure. Actually, this is something that I recently talked about with um, with a group that um, a group chat that I'm in, who's uh, you know managing a lot more money than they used to. So uh, you know, um, dedicated device that's like you know fail proof. So one thing that I recently did for myself and I recommend it to a lot of others is, uh, you know, told everyone to go pick up the latest uh, Mac Airbook or whatnot, the cheapest model. Just have a dedicated computer specifically only doing crypto stuff. Don't download anything. Don't have any communication uh, app. Just literally a blank computer. Treat it as what you would think like your banking terminal. And I think this is a concept that's going to become more relevant into the future. Um, you're going to see products like a Google Chromebook, but it's specifically designed for crypto users to just kind of do their banking in a sense, like future banking, right? Because everything is going steadily on chain. Now, if you want to be even more secure, another step you can take is use a ledger on top of your isolated device. So now you have two layers of security. Not only do you have a device that you do not download any software onto, you don't download anything or you don't even communicate with anyone with. And on top of that, you're using a ledger. So you have a hardware wallet uh, protecting you. Now, if you want to go even safer than that, you can double layer your um, cold storage and your hardware wallet. Now, this is uh, th there's kind of two ways to use hardware wallets. Um, you know, you can use it as physically as just purely a cold storage where you, you store, you don't connect it to anything. And you can also use it as a kind of a active hardware wallet where you connect to apps and sign with it. Right. So if you want it to be super, super secure, which is something that I do myself is I have ledgers that act as cold storage. I don't connect them to anything ever. They only transfer in and out. And then I also have ledgers that are more for daily activities like managing liquidity positions or doing something on a DEX, uh, et cetera. And then on top of that, I'm also using a dedicated device that I don't communicate with anyone on. So I, I take security very seriously because handling a lot of funds in, the, in, in a lot of the hot wallets that I use daily. So 
That would be my advice. No, I think that's a very thin advice. So having a disposable wallet, having a disposable laptop, and adding these layers on top of each other. That's a very thin advice, and this is personally what I do as well. Uh, I want to talk about, the, about one more thing that's been quite impressive lately. It's the median gas price of Ethereum, who has reached a three years low. So on April 27, the median gas price was only 6.4 GUE, which was already the seventh lowest gas median price in the past three years. And the current Ethereum gas fee is approximately 5 GUE. So this is super, super low. And this suggests, of course, like lower network congestion and reduced demand for transaction processing. And it can be due to more transactions moving to layer two or simply a temporary decrease in blockchain activity. Uh, so, AD, I want to go back to you because you're part of Ninja Protocol, and uh, I want to have your take on this. Why do you, why do you think Way is so low at the minute? Well, <laughs> you know, Ninja's a Solana blockchain native uh, project, and I spend most of my time on Solana. So, you know, I wouldn't be the best person to ask why <laughs> is gas prices low on Fair Ethereum. Enough. But, uh, you know, <laughs> if I had to guess, um, one of the major contributing factors, I would say, because, you know, Ethereum is not a network I'm not, like, familiar with at all, right? Um, I would say a big factor to gas prices dropping on Ethereum is you've lost a lot of the retail activity on Ethereum over the past, um, I would say, quarter. Um, and um, a lot of that retail activity was the, quite frankly, like the meme tokens, um, NFTs, um, things of this nature, right? The really retail heavy uh, speculation. And that has primarily moved to faster blockchains such as Solana. And um, that's been the major trend the past uh, four or five months. So I would say that's been a huge factor to why, you know, gas prices on Ethereum have gone down. Um, also on top of that, there's base, which has come out, right? which has also captured a ton of the activity that other chains didn't capture, right? So that's also where a lot of the um, activity that would have previously, you know, kept gas prices a little higher has gone, would be my no, guess. No, that's a fair guess. That, I, that, I think guess. that's a very fair assumption. And a lot of the DGEN, very retail-facing uh, feature of crypto has moved to Bayes or Solana, as you said. Damir, I want to hear it from you. What do you think as a, as a layer one creator what do you think is happening on ethereum at the minute yeah i actually agree with the previous statements basically uh, a lot has moved to layer two uh because the layer one is too expensive uh, and for the same reason you can easily lose retail because nobody wants to afford uh such a high gas price to do simple transactions so overall it makes total sense that if the layer one is too expensive its actual overall usage also gets limited to institutionals and to actually just uh, settling stuff for layer twos. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Powell, do you have any idea here? What's your take? Similar to the, similar to the consensus here? Yeah, of course. So I, I will uh, agree with everyone that has been what has been said. And another thing is I will go, go back once again to that, that uh, uh, also a lot of movement has been generated so far by the institutional capital. Um, and and uh, also the institutional capital was driving, was one of the main driving forces uh, for the recent uh, for the recent um, uh, transaction ability in the space. So uh, um, besides what has been said, where the TVL went, the growth of uh, uh, Base, who uh, is the fastest growing in terms of TVL dynamics right now, chain um, also a, a major role in my opinion in, in the current situation place uh, the institutional capital driven by uh, Bitcoin ETFs. So uh, when, when they started to you know uh, the drowning, the, the price, it's always, it always have been like that. So when the market was going down, the transaction ability was, you know, going low, the gas prices were going low, um, and, and the, 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 the amount of uh, TVL, uh, the, 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 the liquidity on the market was going low, everything was going low because of what, has, what was happening um, with, the, with the Bitcoin and uh, the prices. And as the whole crypto is packed to the Bitcoin, the whole crypto was going down as well. So uh, I, I expect we can see the similar uh, you know, trend all the time. Every time once Bitcoin will go down, the crypto will go down, liquidity will go down, everything will go down. So we will see also reduced, uh, reduced um, uh, fees. And due to that, uh, the, the plus to this is uh, 
uh, another factor this time, so which is institutional capital due to Bitcoin ETFs, which is uh, one of the driving force of such a of such a state that we have right now. So I will just add this. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, on a funny on a funny note, with it's a it's a slightly different topic, but I want to hear your take on it. Oh, hello, Zillion. Thank you for joining us, man. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good, my friend. I'm good. You know what? This one is going to be for you. I want to have your take. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but Forbes recently listed 20 zombie tokens with a market value of more than 1 billion. So this includes Ripple, Phantom, Cardano, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, ICP, Monero, Phantom, Multiverse 6, Flow, Elrond, Tezos, EOS, a, a lot of chains that we're familiar with. And as an example, Ripple, ha they have a market cap of 36 billion, but the network transaction fees last year were only half a million. Now, this might, yeah. be, con <laughs> this might so, be a bit uh, controversial, but uh, I agree with most of this. What do you think, Zillion? So I'm happy to talk about controversial stuff. So the business model for a lot of these guys, um, uh, not naming any names, but for example, EOS, okay? The, the e e <laughs> okay? So EOS, for example, as you remember, it was the most successful ICU ever. I mean, these guys raised three billion dollars you know or something like that right Insane. like tezos man tezos yeah. as well crazy but and these guys they did extremely good job at managing their treasury and at paying themselves but at managing their treasury which means that block one which was the company behind the uh, uh, eos for example made an extremely extremely good moves uh namely because i was back in the day in the in the broke in the in the in the brokerage space okay so i knew kind of who was buying bitcoin during the bear market etc so they made some impressive trades on btc especially um, when btc remember when it crashed down to three that that flash crash that went down all the way to 2000 something or 3000 uh was it in 2020 something like that or uh, 2019 anyways so these guys made the and most of them made a great deal of money having huge treasuries, okay? And, uh, and they managed extremely well their treasuries. So right now, these companies are extremely well capitalized. I mean, uh, 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 XRP is extremely well capitalized. Uh, EOS, although uh, I don't know if you've been following, but there was like a shenanigan with, with Block One and the old holders, etc. But they kind of took themselves out of the, out of the, managed to, to basically uh, uh, untangle their issues, etc. So what ends up happening is that although the, the, the core business might not be productive from a fee, might not be DCF fable. Uh, you're not able to, you know, to run like a free cash flow model on it. Um, they are very good at managing the value of their currency. And they built a community that is basically like kind of a meme, meme uh, coin community. You know, they've, uh, so they, 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 they don't care about the fees. They don't care about the performance of the network. They don't care about the added value, etc. But what they care about is uh, the price movement. Plus they have some great, uh, treasury. So they're able to manage the price. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And they are right. I mean, uh, XRP. We know that they've been buying a lot of businesses, trying to basically produce some cash flow and and do some get some substance in their business. But effectively, these are just big treasuries. Okay, uh, big treasuries, and they're able to manage and to sustain themselves into the in the future because they're able to manage the the price and to manage the 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 growth of the community. But that means. Yeah, sorry. No, you nailed it, man. You nailed it, and uh, I don't want to name anybody, but Tezos. I'm um, not named. I don't. I don't name anyone. No, I'm drunk. Okay, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't want to name maybe anybody, but Tezos. They raised two hundred million that turned into five billion, and since then they've been sponsoring Formula One. Okay, Katie, I want to hear it from you. I can see you want to jump into the battlefield. Um, he just said that like you like controversy. So I mean, Tellos and them, for instance, I think they do extremely well with their treasury and that. But do you really think you can put XRP in the same category when they dump hundreds of millions of dollars of their token every like so often? Like, that's not really great treasury if they have to dump their token to be able to manage it. You know, kind of like forfeits their ability to really manage a treasury properly because they wouldn't have to do that. 
Plus the Thunder like was Like some of the other guys manage them really, really well. And the Thunder of Ripple was hyped for a couple of, I don't know, 50 million, if I remember. That was oh, huge. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and guys like uh, Block One, I mean, they just bought uh, Coindesk. Uh, they established Bullish. Uh, we used to have a talk with the Gibraltar guys saying that uh, Bullish has... You know the exchange Bullish? So you guys know about it. this? Okay, but there you go. <laughs> but it's supposed to be one of the greatest exchanges with the highest volume. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, so uh, okay, look, they've done. These are extremely bright guys uh, in the back scene. Okay, they're able to. They understood that the drift, the grift was basically to raise as much money as possible, try to do something, and if they're not able. They actually, they just raised a lot of money and they're, they're deploying it right now. They're, now they're buying valuable assets. They're buying Coindesk, which is a huge asset. I hope they will not influence the editorial line of yeah. Coindesk. Uh, <laughs> well, but these guys, they know what they're doing. I mean, most of them got extremely rich uh, and, uh, and the, the, they know what they're doing. So, yeah. So, uh, this being said, I want to say one more thing. In the same, um, the same, in the same line of thought, do... The market cap of zombie slash failed tokens in crypto is huge. And I'm not, and I don't want to pitch anything right now, but we, we are working on a coin graveyard to capture that, that value. And I'm going to stop here. Okay. <laughs> but, okay. So I, I, I see that you agree. I see that there is a, there is a consensus. Everybody agrees with this, uh, with this zombie list from Forbes, I would personally argue that Monero should not be in this list at all. But apart, apart from this, this is a quite of an interesting list. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we, should, we have five minutes before jumping into Massa from Damir. I really want to really hear it from you, my friend. But before this, maybe just two or three uh, news that I wanted to cover. I'll be, I'll be brief with this one. The first one is that um, Phoenix Wallets was recently banned from the US and the founder was actually put in jail. So that was, that was a very heavy, heavy hit from the US. But you see the US, they have this track record of not really engaging or not really pushing for privacy solutions, right? So Tornado Cash, the founders were jailed as well. And Monero is not really friendly with, uh, US is not really friendly with Monero. So this is kind of a natural progression. Vitali, Vitalik Buterin, so the founder of Ethereum, recently tweeted about privacy, quote, privacy is normal. Privacy is for good guys. It's for moms and bike messengers and foodies. Privacy is for business meetings and voting booths. It's why we have shower curtains. It's why we have that little padlock icon in our browser. End of quote. So I do agree with, uh, I do agree with my friend Vitalik here. And before we jump to Massa, one more thing, uh, which is quite interesting, is the fact that um, Binance, there was this, this stats interesting from Root Data. They pointed out that since November 2021, Binance has launched 30 launch pool projects and Binance Labs has invested in 21, 21 of them. So um, I'm not sure if this is an unfair advantage or if Binance Labs are playing their hands right. But I guess this is a debate we can have another day. All right. Damir, are you with us, my friend? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. So for, for the audience, as a quick introduction, uh, Massa is a layer one blockchain and they claim to have tackled the trilemma, the eternal trilemma of blockchain, scalability, decentralization and security. You know what? I will add privacy as well as one of the main focus that a blockchain should have. So maybe you should... Um, as a quick introduction, what is Massa? Sure. So Massa basically is a layer one blockchain. Uh, it uses a very custom consensus algorithm that we have built after years of research. And uh, yeah, it's built from scratch uh, for maximal performance and decentralization at very low fees. So to use it, it's very low fees, basically. Another cool thing is that you can become a node runner for very cheap, just a desktop computer, $10 of tokens, and you can be a node runner. You can get rewarded and you can actually participate. So all this together makes it one of the cheapest to run and cheapest to use blockchains in the industry currently. And we've seen how uh, high fees can make people flee away. Well, we try to solve that as well. Directly on layer one without relying on layer twos. 
And uh, of course, we have also quite a bunch of innovations, and uh, I'm very excited to tell you about them. Awesome, my friend. So obviously, the layer one segment is very competitive. We have all the Ethereum killers from 2017 to 2022. And recently, we've had new layer one, Aptos, Sui, Sei, who are all so heavily VC funded. They raise hundreds of millions. So my question for you is, how do you think you're going to compete with those giants? And also, I want to hear about your, your funding at Massa. Uh, sure. So, of course, we don't have as much funding as these giants. That's uh, kind of obvious. Uh, we have raised a first round of about $5.6 million uh, a year and a half ago. Then uh, we did a second sale for about uh, $3 million, uh on Republic recently. And uh, so basically, in total, we have raised about $10 million. So yeah, it's, it's very far from these other competitors. Uh, that's why we're trying to use the funds as efficiently as we can and uh, to have very different approach uh, compared to these guys. Uh, very, basically, we focus on unique features, decentralization, uh, where others focus on mostly uh, raw uh, power and uh, essentially uh, a very centralized set of validators that are highly controllable. Uh, we try to decentralize to the maximum. Uh, basically, we try to follow the original philosophy of, uh, of blockchains. Okay, so can you tell me more about those innovations that you've put in place? With uh, 10 million in funding, which is already decent, how are you going to challenge like Avalanche, Phantom, um, Aptos, Sui? What's the pieces of innovation that put you at the forefront of this uh, battle? Well, uh, I think our two main innovation outside of the ba basic, which is it's cheap to run node and cheap to uh, run transactions, our two main innovations are one, autonomous smart contracts. So you know that usually smart contracts are programs that sit on the blockchain and they do nothing unless somebody sends a transaction to call them from the outside. Well, uh, that's why f when it comes to automation, usually people rely on external services like Gelato, Chainlink Automation, or plain simple AWS. So obviously, when you have private keys controlling, uh, uh, let's say, a trading bot on AWS, obviously there's, there's a risk of hack there. Uh, the other problem you have is that when your smart contracts, when your project relies on external services uh, for automation, whenever the team stops paying for them or has any kind of issue, the whole project just stops. So in Massa, for the first time, we allow smart contracts to live by themselves over time to schedule operations in the future. And this allows stuff like autonomous NFTs that evolve over time. Uh, it allows for automatically liquidating under collateralized positions in lending. There's many applications you can imagine and everything works without relying on external infrastructure, on external automation services. And this reduces costs, increases decentralization and resilience. So that's one of the two main features. And we're very proud of this one because we're the only blockchain to our knowledge that has this. And the second one is the on-chain web hosting. So th for this one, we're not super unique. There's a few other chains that host websites. But the cool thing is that when uh, you allow your website to be hosted on the blockchain, it becomes suddenly resilient to hacks, to censorship. The website is fully replicated on thousands of nodes around the world. Uh, in terms of compliance, also, it's very promising because these new EU laws particularly target front-ends. So it's, that's why you see many projects that deploy without a front-end nowadays. And they allow the community to build front-ends. Well, in our case, we allow people to deploy the front-ends directly on chain. So they kind of remove uh, the ownership of that front-end that will live forever on the blockchain. And when you combine these two features, the autonomous smart contracts and the web on chain, you see that you can deploy your whole DeFi project as a builder and you don't rely on any external infrastructure. You can just launch it, it's gonna run forever. You don't need to maintain anything on the side. And that's uh, the first time these two features are put together and we're very proud of this. We are very eager to show you what we can do with it. That's exciting, my friend. So if I summarize for you, with 10 million in funding, you wanna compete with the other layer one giants through two pieces of innovation. One being the autonomous smart contracts and the other one is the on-chain web hosting. Am I correct? 
Yes, that's the main features. And of course, we also incentivize people to run nodes because it's cheap and uh, to use the blockchain because it's also very cheap in terms of fees directly on the layer one. We achieve about 10,000 transactions per second. That, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. What about privacy? Is there, uh, is there anything you want to share regarding this? I think it's important for people listening in the audience, especially when we see the increased scrutiny from the US as a whole against privacy layers. What's your take on this? Well, in the first place, blockchain are, are kind of private in the sense that you don't need to put your real identity on it. You can always just put a pseudonym or an address. But you're right that address transaction can still be tracked. There can be issues there. So uh, Massa was not built initially uh, targeting privacy. And uh, privacy is something we are studying right now. So recently we have signed a partnership with Starknet who do ZKs basically, and uh, we are actually studying uh, ZKs to see if we can somehow in the future add uh, this privacy aspect to Massa, which is currently missing. Guys, anybody in the panel has questions, feel free to jump ahead. Um, I, I'm uh, welcoming any questions from the from the panel. And I wanted to ask you, my friend, like, um, I don't think I've seen this on the website, but forgive me if, if this is written somewhere. What's your plan on a token from your native, from your chain? I mean, it's a, it's pretty, this goes without saying that all the major chains, they have a native token. It might come way later in the roadmap, but uh, what is your plan here? Uh, we already have, uh, we actually have launched our mainnet uh, on the 15th of January. We have listed the token on a couple exchanges. So we have a native token. But for now, the ecosystem is still budding, it's still starting. So uh, our, now our main goal is to grow the usage of the, of the system, bring more node runners. We have already 1,600 node runners. Uh, we have launched a bridge with Ethereum that works in both directions. Already $2 million have been bridged. We have launched uh, a decentralized exchange that has been launched on, the, on Massa. And it's been running for two weeks now. It already hit three million in volume. Uh, we just signed partnerships with Retrieve, with uh, Starknet, with Umbrella and others. And uh, the idea is that now all this backbone is fully operational. And we're already seeing some projects pop like dashboards, telegram bots, casinos, meme coins. There's even already arbitrage going on. So yeah, we are pretty excited and we have set up a whole liquidity incentive program that you can uh, you can check out i really invite you to check it out the api is very high right now you know what you need to, to bring volume to your chain you need a big a big meme coin but you didn't hear it from me <laughs> actually we are uh we have heard of people building meme coins in the community but of course we cannot officially condone it of course of course katie you had a question my dear yeah, I have a question. Well, it's kind of like two questions put into the one. Your 10,000 transactions per second, is that because of your architecture? Because please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not super diverse with your chain. Um, you guys have that block graph like architecture, right? It's multi threading type of thing where they kind of like run parallel with each other. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So basically, multiple blocks are produced at the same time in the network and propagated at the same time. So we have this uh, parallelization in block production that accelerates everything. Has that been like underdone with like, or undergone, sorry, like extreme stress testing? Like, have you guys tested that under extreme transactions to see if it'll hold up? Actually, yes, we have tested first in, in theory, so we have run some uh, uh, some mathematics on it for three years, back in 2017, actually. Then we have uh, run some simulation, also uh, around 2019. Then we have started a testnet around 2021 that lasted for two years. Uh, the testnet has been stress tested with uh, thousands of people on it. And uh, we also uh, proceeded to get audited. The theory was audited by scientists. Uh, it's actually cited about tw 30 times now by uh, scientists. And uh, the code itself was audited. We have uh, uh, audit reports. We have a bug bounty there as well, uh, running. And uh, yeah, now the mainnet is running and people have already started to try to spam it. That's why we already have about a billion transaction processed. That's a good sign when people try to spam your chain. Take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Awesome, awesome. So what's next for uh, Massa then? What are your uh, next couple of uh, milestones? Well, now that we have the backbone uh, up and running, 
uh, we need to focus on new new aspects. We need to build the ecosystem. We need to focus on marketing. So there's going to be a very strong focus on marketing. And that's also why I'm here today, uh, to give more visibility to the chain, to bring more people in, to show them what we can do here that you cannot do elsewhere, uh, to get people excited. We are going to, of course, continue working on the technological part. There's go we're going to enable decentralized domain names, the on-chain web very soon. Uh, we are going to add more support for more currencies on the bridge. We are going to deploy the Umbrella Oracle so that builders can have access to price feeds. We are going to expand the ecosystem. We have started a full grant program and actually I invite all the builders to join. Uh, there's already teams working on an NFT marketplace, a lending platform, MetaMask support, and many other things for which we have dedicated a very high budget. And in the long run, of course, we also have plans to explore EVM compatibility so that we can bring more people in. Uh, real world assets, we have some ideas here, uh, more on that soon. We want to deepen our collaboration with other ecosystems such as Starknet. And uh, of course, in the end, we want Massa to become basically a hub for decentralized blockchain automation. So that's the general vision. No, that sounds great. That sounds great. And don't forget, don't forget, having analytical tools on your chain, such as Bubble Maps. I don't want to preach my own uh, my own church here, but uh, uh, with Bubble Maps, it's definitely a nice way to examine the unchained activity of tokens and NFT, and NFT on your chain. But man, having creating your own chain must be so overwhelming. There's so much to do. You have to build the protocols. You have to build the oracles. You have to build the compatibility with other chain. You have to bring on the users. Like, uh, how big is your team with all of this uh, ambitions? Oh, we are a bit less than 30 people. Oh, 30 people, that's still a good amount. Are you mostly in France? Like, do you have office in France or are you mostly decentralized team? Uh, we work most, mostly exclusively uh, remotely. Uh, many people are in France, not really in Paris, but in France. Uh, and some others are in the US, uh, in Portugal. Uh, there were some people in Eastern Europe. So globally, uh, we have a global team, but with a strong presence in, uh, in France. Oh, you know, I'm in France, my friend. You should, we should meet up at some point. Oh, for sure. If you're in Paris, let's go for a beer. The French Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any, any other question from the panel? Defy God, you came in a bit, uh, a bit late. I'm sorry, I didn't, did it, didn't hear it much from you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I came late. I... No worries, man. No worries at all. Make it up on time. I just have only a question. Uh, um, Masa is building on, on a new blockchain. Um, <clears throat> I just want to ask what specific issue, I mean, the problem they are going to solve in blockchain, using blockchain technology. What are, what are the um, kind of problems they solve using blockchain technology? Uh, that's, so, yeah, that's so that's actually an interesting question because there are so much chains like do we need how many layer one do we need i think we can reformulate the question uh we need as many layer ones as there is uh, requirements for a layer one so uh in our case we try to get the performance uh, and ease of use of a layer two directly to the layer one so that's kind of our target to avoid having a layer two uh, which is an advantage in a sense that uh, if you have a layer two, you, I think Vitalik has posted about this recently. If there's any kind of issue, uh, it's very hard to fix, uh, very hard to, uh, to solve. While uh, if everything is directly in layer one, you have less centralization problems, uh, less resilience problems. You don't have to have these awkward smart contracts that do the interface between the layer one and the layer two. And most of them currently are actually simple multi-sigs that hold billions of dollars. So it's very scary if something gets hacked there. Uh, so in terms of resilience, that's something very interesting. And what problem are we actually trying to solve here? We're trying to solve the problem of automation. Currently, that's our main target. How do we make, uh, basically, currently in Web2, everything is almost fully automated. So very few things have require human interaction. On the blockchain, everything is still very manual and we're trying to automate it. That's one thing we're trying to do. And also to make everything accessible to anyone. Anyone with a desktop computer at home can become a node runner on NASA. Uh, 
And that's something very powerful and very unique that we're trying to promote. Uh, so in terms of real world uh, problems, well, we try to solve everything that uh, blockchains are trying to solve, financial freedom, connection to the real world economy, uh, and adding way more new financial tools that don't, ex that don't exist in the, in the real world because these are made possible by the blockchain. So these are our main targets currently, basically DeFi, real world assets, and, uh, and of course, all the usual blockchain related things uh, like uh, staking uh, and exchanges. Fantastic, my dear. And to wrap it up, where can we follow Massa? Where can we hear from you if we are interested in uh, learning more? Well, we have a decent community. It's about 150,000 people. Feel free to join it. Most of them are on our Discord. You can find everything on uh, massa.net and ASSA. Uh, feel free to join it there. Uh, all the links are there. There's a Telegram group, uh, international. There are uh, Telegram groups for different countries, different languages. And we have this huge uh, Discord, obviously, uh, that's the main base of operations. Uh, if you're a builder, also feel free to join. We have these very in interesting incentive programs. So feel free to join and uh, and try to build to get some uh, reward with, with some coins. And finally, if you want to uh, participate in the mass uh, build-up of the ecosystem, feel free to join us. We have a very strong liquidity incentive program going on right now. So if you run a node, uh, and it's very easy to do, currently the APY is about 100%. So it's going to go down as people join, but uh, it's uh, currently very high. Also, in terms of uh, liquidity incentives, we should bring liquidity on the DEXs on Massa. The rewards are also extremely high right now. We're talking about 800% uh, APR currently, which is also going to go down as people join. But uh, yeah, be the, f be the first to catch Ooh. it if you want to try. 800%. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Those are some high numbers. All right. So for the audience listening, Massa.net, if you want to follow their Twitter, if you want to join their Discord, and if you want to be posted on the latest news this is the this is the end of this uh, round table i'm going to wrap it up that was lovely to catch up with everyone katie defy god 80 thank you for joining us and uh, demir of course i hope you i hope you had a great time it was great thank you guys thanks everybody thank you for joining all right goodbye bye bye, -bye.